As our living planet drifted on the sea of eternity, soon after the dawning of the 20th century, the winds of change began to blow. Events were to take place which would change the course of mankind forever. The atomic age had arrived. As man detonated weapons of immense power, lights started to appear in the sky in a way that suggested that something was following the course of events. The shattering thought imposed itself that we were perhaps not the only inhabitants of the universe. Since the beginning of civilization, we had been watching the stars, never dreaming that they, in turn, might be watching us. History was about to change. Because these lights appeared suddenly in the sky over Washington on July 20th, 1952, moving from the White House to the Capitol, hundreds of people witnessed the extraordinary event and it left them stunned. The lights instantly jumped from one position to another. They were also observed by high military officials who knew what the lights were trying to say. The public had never seen anything like this, whereas the military had already a long history of involvement with these alien visitors, but had kept it from the public. An immediate emergency meeting was called to formulate a plan to divert public attention away from the occurrences. From that day on, it was decided to place the subject under the highest classification of security. Then came the first announcement to mislead the public made by Chief of Air Intelligence, Major General John Sanford. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. From that day on, the biggest secret of the century began. How did it all start? After the first atomic bomb was detonated, more tests were made of the effects on the environment and human subjects to gauge the degree of contamination unleashed. No knowledge of the devastating long-term effects existed at this time. Here in New Mexico, an army base close to a small town called Roswell became the focus of attention on July 2, 1947, when Bill Brazel, a farmer, found a crashed disc-shaped craft on his land. The military arrived on the scene and quickly isolated the spot when they found debris scattered over a wide area. They also found four dead humanoid alien bodies who had been ejected from the craft. Because of many recent UFO sightings by the military, they accepted the existence of visitors from outer space who obviously possessed a technology which was far beyond our understanding. Now, for the first time, they had tangible evidence and were eager to learn its secrets. Roswell was the home of the 509th Bomber Wing, the sole American atomic bomber group. Major Jesse Marcel, an Army intelligence officer, was engaged on the recovery operation and asked Walter Hott, the Army public relations officer, to prepare a story for the local newspaper. They told me to prepare a release with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time, which is what I did. The story was published in the local paper. The news was also prepared to be aired by the local radio, but Judd Roberts, the radio station manager, was warned not to broadcast it. Sorry. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, 
you are, we, we understand that you have some information. And we want to assure you that if you release it on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy. And so we suggest that you not do it. He said, when I mean in jeopardy, like maybe three days. Preparations were made at Roswell Army Base for the transport of the wreckage. Robert Shirky witnessed the secret handling of the parts. They came in the front door, straight down the hallway, and right out onto the ramp to climb in the airplane. These were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed uh, flying saucer at that time, a UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. And very short, very quick. Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, hit back into the doorway of the pops office. And I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see too. <laughs> On instructions from the Pentagon, Thomas Jefferson DuBose and General Ramey created a cover story saying the crashed object was a weather balloon. We used that in order to of uh, persuade the curiosity of the press. The wreckage was loaded back onto an aircraft and flown out under cover of great security and secrecy to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The pilot kept silent for several years, but informed his wife after the story appeared in a newspaper. I guess now that uh, they're putting in the paper, I can tell you about this. I've wanted to tell you for years. He said, I want you to read this article because it's a true story. And I not only know that it's true, but I'm the pilot who flew the wreckage of the UFO to Dayton, Ohio. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was considered the most technologically advanced research center in the United States. The wreckage of the Roswell crash was dismantled for analysis. The matter was considered of such importance that the orders came directly from President Truman. Under the cover of the CIA, Truman created a group called Majestic 12 for dealing with and covering up all information about UFOs. President Truman gave the task of handling UFOs only to the highest ranking generals. After the Roswell crash, a special group of scientists was formed and facilities built to be prepared to deal with any further UFO crashes which would occur. Wendell Stevens was a lieutenant colonel in technical intelligence in the U.S. Air Force and is now a UFO investigator. Now having a, a, an extraterrestrial vehicle and some bodies in their hands didn't know when the next one would come down, where they came from, what they were going to do about it. There were a lot of unanswered questions. And the United States was in a turmoil at the time administratively because we were shifting from a war economy and military industrial command structure to a civilian structure. Uh, so the military was still dominant and they wanted to keep control of this until they knew what was happening. So they created, remember General Marshall was our Secretary of State at the time, he was a four-star, five-star uh, These people selected certain representatives from the military industrial complex that they controlled generals and admirals and certain scientists that uh, worked with the military and worked with uh, industrial planning. These men were designated as a task force to take charge of any event that followed. And it, one did. Almost a year later, on the 25th of March of 1978, next one did crash and it came down under observation by radar so that we knew where it landed at the time that it struck the ground and a helicopter was over it in less than an hour. It reported what it observed and the plan generated by these people from the military industrial complex after the Roswell crash was immediately put into place all of the generals and admirals and advisors and scientists were contacted and ordered to proceed to a base in Colorado where they were 
driven, picked up, and driven to the crash site. Now all of these men are, have gone to the scene to see for themselves uh, what an alien vehicle looks like, and they were going to advise General Marshall directly, who was controlling everything from remote position telephones, on how to proceed. And when an operation is that big, you can't cover everything up. We discovered that the owner of the property where the vehicle came down was uh, arrested in his house with his family, and they were kept in the house for four days, not allowed to go outside. All the roads in the area were blocked. All access was closed. People that lived close enough to look, know something about it were kept in their house. Now, if it never happened, then this evidence wouldn't exist. But now we are finding solid evidence that something strange did happen and that, that these events actually took place. Then we found people who observed the recovery of the craft from a distance that saw the, the, the task force moving across uh, off roads over country to uh, a secure military facility in Los Alamos. With these leads, we were able to turn up other witnesses, all of whom had been sworn to secrecy by their superiors at the time they participated in these events. And only a few of them would talk to us, and only on condition that they not be identified because of their vulnerability. Uh, what happens in a case of violation of security oaths of this nature, they could lose all pay and allowances to or ever come to, they could be imprisoned and they could be fined a, a lot of things that none of them could stand. Through Secretary of State General Marshall, the security of the UFO situation was intensified. A closer relationship developed between the military and Majestic 12. As time passed, the power of Majestic 12 grew stronger. Virgil Armstrong was an intelligence officer with the CIA and worked with highly classified assignments. He retired with the rank of Major. I received documents which said that a UFO had landed in the middle of White Sands, New Mexico proving grounds. And that this object was inert, was under surveillance, and uh, would be kept under surveillance until they could determine uh, whether it was hostile or friendly. It later turned out that uh, it was friendly in that the occupants were dead. And uh, when we got aboard, there were five bodies. The bodies uh, were diminutive in size, in other words, 3.5 feet. The largest one was uh, just under four feet. Two of them were obviously the commanding officers uh, because two of them wore epaulets on their shoulders. Uh, later it turns out that they were all male. When we flew them back to Wright-Patterson, of course, the examination, physical examination, and the autopsy, of course, revealed that they were indeed all male. From descriptions given by several witnesses, the aliens have very large eyes, a small nose, and a small mouth. They are usually about three feet six inches in height and have no body hair. Now, consider, if you will, the position of the United States government at this time. They proudly thought of themselves as the most powerful nation on Earth, having recently produced the atomic bomb and won World War II with it. They had built a jet aircraft that exceeded the speed of sound in flight or wood in October of 47. They had built bombers with intercontinental range that carried weapons of enormous destruction. Now, imagine what it was like for these same leaders, all of whom had witnessed the panic of the Orson Welles broadcast in the War of the Worlds of 1938. Thousands of Americans panicked at a realistically presented invasion of Earth. But imagine their horror as they actually viewed the dead bodies of the real aliens. Imagine their shock as they tried to determine how these saucers were powered and could discover no part even remotely similar to components they were familiar with. No cylinders, no pistons, no propellers, no vacuum tubes. It's only when you fully understand the overwhelming helplessness the government was faced with in the summer of 1947 can you comprehend their perceived need for a total, thorough, and sweeping cover-up to include the use of deadly force. President Truman ordered a heightened level of security after the capture of a live alien from a UFO which had crashed. Because of the ever-increasing numbers of UFO sightings at the time, 
it was decided to create a project called Blue Book, which was designed to suppress public knowledge and create an atmosphere of ridicule around the subject of UFOs. Professor J. Allen Hynek was a professor of astronomy and an astronomical advisor to the United States Air Force on their UFO educational program. And I know the, the, the job they had. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. Uh, and I saw it in my own eyes happen that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which was quite a few, they made point of that and, and uh, let that out to the media. Things that, the, the cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, uh, the media away from them. For their, they had a job to do, uh, to, whether rightfully or wrongly, to keep the public from getting excited. A live alien was captured in 1948 after a UFO crashed in America. He refused to communicate for one year and was given the name EBE, or Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. He later began to communicate and gave details of his home planet. EBE had a large crystal which he linked to his mind telepathically and was able to communicate with his own race. He was also able to see into the past and future and perform many other amazing feats. He told of believing in the universe as the supreme being and stated that his race lived in harmony without wars and had nearly eliminated all diseases. He said they lived to approximately 800 years of age and that their technology was far in advance of ours. The authorities were amazed by the things they were shown through the crystal. EBE was able to communicate with huge spaceships which were holding orbital positions thousands of miles from the Earth. He told them that their craft were capable of reaching areas in the universe beyond our imagination and that they were operated by thought control coupled to biological computers and consequently did not have any control systems as we understood them. He talked about his planet and how their technology had created a system where everything was self-functional and did not require a workforce to operate it, and that everything was monitored from a central control system. He said that technicians were present there. He said their power source was eternal energy from the cosmos. He told them that his race didn't have a government like Earth, but a society governed by wise elders who sat in council to make decisions of policy. They did not have a monetary system because the needs of the people were catered for by the Federation, which made them all equal. At the request of the aliens, a meeting was arranged with President Eisenhower in 1954. It took place amid tight security at a secret location. At this meeting, negotiations took place regarding the permitted presence of the aliens on Earth. Eisenhower told the aliens that the world was not yet ready for them. Eisenhower witnessed an alien uh, demonstration of technology and power at Muroc Dry Lake, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base. I believe we made a deal, uh, and the deal was that uh, in exchange for super technology, super weapons technology, we would agree to ignore the abductions that were going on. He uh, made it a more military oriented than say a civilian president would have and it's this i think that has let his actions let the real power of the executive office slip through the hands of the president into mj-12 the president of the united states does not have a high enough clearance to know the whole thing and it's interesting to note that above top secret there's 38 levels of clearances Eisenhower is the last president to have a full briefing on the alien problem. There was a disdain of elected officials throughout the intelligence and military communities, and uh, they just didn't like elected officials. So uh, every president since then has not had high enough clearance to know the whole problem. Now they know there's aliens, they know we've recovered saucers, and they know that uh, we're trying to get technology. But the, there are certain other things 
which probably only about 25 people on the face of this earth know. But while the visitors monitor our every move with their superior technology, being technically advanced does not always ensure their own safety. This was proved by the UFO crash in the Kalahari Desert in 1989. One of the most documented cases of all time referred to a 60-foot wide spacecraft which was forced down on the border of South Africa. This craft impacted with the desert at high speed, causing a crater 450 feet in diameter and 36 feet deep. Official military documents reveal that the craft entered South African airspace at 1.45 p.m. on the 7th of May, 1989, and was intercepted by two Mirage jet fighters. Because the craft failed to respond to communication, one of the fighters was ordered to attack the craft with an experimental laser cannon. This caused the craft to lose altitude and crash. After the craft was retrieved, uh, it was removed to a secret Air Force base. And on arrival at this base, um, it was found a door had partially opened in the side of the craft. Uh, hydraulic um, pumping gear uh, was brought to the scene and the door was forced open. Uh, when this was done, two aliens staggered out of the craft um, and it was found that one appeared to be seriously injured. They were immediately arrested and removed to a medical centre where a medical team was sent in to try to assist. The authorities at the scene entered the UFO and hieroglyphics were found inside the machine, uh, alien hieroglyphics of course, and various items of electronic equipment were also the retrieval team from America arrived eventually and the um, object plus the aliens were eventually taken by C-5 Galaxy transporters back to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where uh, further analysis was um, taken on. When the military entered the craft they quickly removed portable equipment and instruments, some of which were considered useful as potential weapons. This was not certain at the time, but was clarified after scientific investigation. Also found aboard the craft were a series of hieroglyphics, which indicated that the aliens had a written form of communication. The writing gave the impression of an alien alphabet, but it is not known if any of the scientists present were able to understand its meaning. data found on the craft were stored on a system of silicone slides. It was obvious to everybody at the site that they were dealing with a very advanced technology, including the propulsion system. As more and more alien technology comes into the possession of our scientists, more understanding is being gained about the physics involved in producing propulsion systems capable of taking man deep into space. The American Naval Deep Space Command, who also call themselves the Guardians of the High Frontier, are responsible for the location and identification of all objects in space around Earth. It's their claim that they can track and identify an object as small as a football at a distance of 30,000 miles. They refer to unrecognized tracks as unidentified orbiting objects and have been known to locate up to 6,000 of these in a three-month period. Their area of responsibility lies outside the Earth's atmosphere. Below this level, the monitoring of the sky is taken over by NORAD, which is the North American Air Defense Network. Larger radio telescopes are on station throughout the world. They can scan the heavens to distances of hundreds of light years. This network of space surveillance ensures that any object heading towards the Earth can be tracked from a vast distance. As an object approaches, it is monitored throughout its journey. If any object should land or crash on Earth, the contact point is known immediately. A quick response team swiftly arrive on the scene. This network was created after the Roswell incident, and since that time has developed into a sophisticated search and retrieval operation. Quick response teams are located in strategic positions throughout the world. Once there, they isolate the area ensure that the public is kept unaware of sensitive incidents. All over in NATO, they are interested. It's generals, colonels, the Americans are interested, the 
English are interested. Everybody knows them. There was one in Wiesbaden with one of the, the uh, squadrons down there, and I worked with the colonel. And one afternoon, I'm going to nearby town. And I went to the office in civil clothes to pick up something, and he was sitting there. Hey, Major, he said, where are you going? I'm going to city. What is that? He pointed. I had my badge here with a flying saucer in my blue jacket. He said, what? That, damn it, that. He said, nothing. It's a flying saucer. I said, it could be. You Americans have proved they don't exist. Shut up, he said. He took the telephone. Jack, Pete, come on now. And in a sudden, we had five officers and himself. And we talked for three hours. And they knew exactly as much as I did. So everybody knows about it. And it is not, it is not illegal. And you are not disliked. I have talked with generals for hours, not on my purpose. They asked me to talk. They have received my, my uh, magazine, UFO Contact, for years. So they are interested. But since the public opinion is secrecy. Although many years have passed since the beginning of the UFO era, the veil of secrecy has remained to keep the public uninformed. Despite the suppression of information, millions of people throughout the world are still seeing and reporting the presence of UFOs in our airspace. And many more millions are now firm believers in the presence of extraterrestrial flying machines. They know that UFOs exist. I think what has happened over the years, the government has uh, lied so much that they have painted themselves into a corner and it's almost impossible for them to tell the truth today. The biggest secret in the history of mankind and the government is not going to let this out. You, there is no way to get anything out of the Freedom of Information Act. In Russia, the subject of UFOs is now out in the open. Marina Popovich is a retired Russian cosmonaut and fighter pilot. During her military career, she was twice awarded her country's highest military order, Hero of the Soviet Union. She is now one of Russia's leading UFO researchers. Ten years ago, people only made jokes about this subject. Now the attitude to UFOs is very positive. The majority, 80%, think there is extraterrestrial intelligence and that this intelligence is trying to establish mutual contact with us. Now cosmonauts and pilots are more willing to report their contacts with UFOs when they have taken place. Unlike the rest of the world, the Soviet Union has an openness about the subject of UFOs. They even have a monthly television program devoted entirely to it. In the near future, university courses will also be available to study the subject. Several Soviet generals have already stated that there is no question as to what UFOs are. We know they are alien spacecraft. But at the Center for UFO Studies, we have a computerized data bank that now has more than 75,000 UFO reports on it. And what is even more interesting, they come from, by latest count, from 133 countries. When you start reeling off the countries, it sounds like a roll call at the United Nations. And. Uh, even more interesting than the just numbers themselves don't mean so much. But the thing that finally convinced me that we were not dealing with nonsense is basically the caliber of the witnesses. Uh, many of the reports are made by highly responsible people, impeccable integrity, people in, in, in technical training, air traffic controllers, and military and commercial pilots. Finally got to the point, it took me quite some time, I finally got to the point, however, where I simply said, I can't continue to call these people deluded or nuts. They're, they are seeing something, something is real. The late J. Allen Hynek was an astronomer, just like I am. His background and mine are very similar. Uh, he uh, was for many years a professor of astronomy, and so was I. And uh, what Hynek said was, UFO research is leading us kicking and screaming into the science of the 21st century. Like Hynek, I sought to debunk the reality of UFO phenomena, and like him, discovered just the opposite. Technology has advanced rapidly over the past 50 years for all the world to see. 
but in secret locations amid tight security, the true advance of technology is hidden from public knowledge. From one such location came the stealth bomber. This futuristic aircraft is the only type known which has the ability to fly into radar protected areas unobserved, almost without sound, to perform whatever task is necessary. The technology used in the production of the aircraft is a giant leap forward from conventional technology and the question has to be asked, where did it come from? At one super secret US government test facility situated in the Nevada desert, strange glowing lights are regularly seen performing aerobatic displays which are far beyond the capability of our known aircraft. They seem to be intelligently controlled. Can this be yet another example of some secret, very advanced technology? Or are the authorities hiding some exotic foreign contrivance? Here at Area 51, also known as Dreamland, is the most highly protected and secret facility in the whole of the United States. Bob Lazar, a physicist, worked on special projects within this complex and felt compelled to reveal what he saw. They are actively and have in their possession uh, alien spacecraft and they are actively uh, undergoing analysis and flying them. They set up and produce their own gravitational field. Just as the Earth holds all matter down, they produce that same field but out of phase and it, it repels itself. The effects that can cause the way in which everything operates is, is by all intents and purposes magic. I mean, it is so far beyond uh, our level of technology. Why is such technology available only to the few and not to the whole of mankind? Have we the right to know? Are we ready for it yet? Or is the race for technological advantage more important? Why keep a secret about probably one of the most important events in history that there's been contact from an alien civilization. It's a significant event in history, more significant than anything. With the tremendous distances involved, travel to the stars would seem impossible. But with man's endeavor and resourcefulness, these problems will be overcome as they always have been in the past. Scientific estimates tell us that there will be a breakthrough in space travel in the near future. When the boundaries of distance break down, the Earth will become our home, the universe, our world. If NASA has its way, many of the next generation will be residents of Mars, and the move towards this has already begun with the development of a space station. This was the essential first step towards making man a citizen of the universe. What is really the long-range purpose of the space station? And we have worked on that question for a long time in NASA. We have started in the early 60s uh, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Werner von Braun and others uh, to, to look at long-range goals uh, beyond the moon, beyond uh, uh, Mars even. And only recently, uh, in fact it was uh, July 20th, 1989, the 20th anniversary of the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon, that uh, President George Bush uh, proposed a new program, a long-range program, uh, with a goal to return to the moon and eventually go on to Mars, to the United States, as a long-range commitment. And as we develop the space station, the space station itself will be used as a test bed, as a laboratory to test new technologies. And you need space to develop those technologies. As long as we are still on Earth, we, can, we can't just talk about it. The question of which technology to use for this, uh, what we call the Space Exploration Initiative, that's the written name, SEI, Space Exploration Initiative, what technology to use in the area of propulsion or life support, or materials and structures and uh, power and communications is being analyzed and investigated by NASA right now. And we're doing it in, in a number of categories. We're looking at present-day technologies, tomorrow technologies, and advanced technologies, which are 
day after tomorrow. What was yesterday's science fiction is today's very palpable truth. Grandfather's spine-chilling fantasies have become an indispensable part of modern life. Jesko von Puttkammer was NASA's advisor to the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry. You know, the reason I worked with Gene Roddenberry was because he wanted us to help him uh, portray a future 200 years from now as we would like it to be. Very positive technology having become our friend instead of our enemy. Uh, and technology as a partner of humans and of course the story itself of uh, of this um, machine voyager or Vija uh, looking for its maker its creator which is really um, a, a metaphor of humans looking for their god and it's the god seeker story and uh, so he wanted nasa to to uh, show that the technology which the movie and his tv series depicts is accurate, that the physics is accurate, that the mathematics is accurate, that the astronomy is accurate. The propulsion system of the of the Star Trek consists of two two major elements. One is the energy source to put uh, just to provide energy, which is the antimatter system. That makes sense, that could be done. But the propulsion itself to push the ship, it's called a warp drive, and that has to do with changing space itself and, and flying faster than the speed of light. We know what antimatter is, uh, and that uh, when you have antimatter and real matter and it comes together, you get uh, you know, a tremendous explosion, you get a tremendous energy, E equal mc square, as Einstein said. And so this is the most powerful reaction you get in the universe, therefore the, the Starship Enterprise uses it. The message from the alien visitors is becoming clear. The human race is producing more problems than it is solving. A change of direction is necessary to guarantee a safe transition into the future. They are here to watch. They started this program a couple of thousand years ago. They are very highly technical and spiritual advanced. These people have a technique that they can foretell development in cosmos for centuries. And they knew thousands of years ago what were going to happen to them. So they prepared for that situation. And we go forward to our time. Now they are here in our atmosphere in large numbers. They have always been here. Now they are here in large numbers to look over what we are doing, simply because they know that we'll kill ourselves in many ways. If we don't push the button, we'll be killed by poison. If, they, if we don't kill each other by poison, we'll kill each other by too many people. Earth, the gem of the cosmos, a living, breathing miracle of creation, the home of mankind, a partnership of dependency and loyalty to each other. The passing of time saw man forget his loyalty. He began to poison and suffocate his planet because of his growing need for power to fuel his technology. A scientist of great wisdom and vision, Nikola Tesla, foresaw this danger and offered the world his discovery of the magic wave as pollution-free energy. His offer was rejected. Tesla gave you uh, multi-phase power, he gave you AC power, the practical transmission of electrical power, the rotating uh, electromagnetic field that made motors and generators possible, and so he literally helped you bring in the electrical 20th century. Had it not been for Nikola Tesla, your cities would still be dark, uh, you still would not have electric power, and you'd still be struggling around in the dark. So yes, Nikola Tesla was important to us. Had we listened to Tesla about the other parts of the magic wave he had discovered, he would have given us cheap energy. I delivered a paper in Ottawa, Canada, where I gave the actual mechanism by which his um, 
amplified transmitter, his magnifying transmitter, actually worked. There are over a thousand papers in the scientific literature that show that mechanism is real. It would have worked, and he could have given the, the world cheap energy. You could not, however, have had a uh, power meter on that that you sell it to field folks. They could have tapped it cheaply and freely uh, just for building the antennas and putting in the taps. And so uh, the powers that be suppressed Tesla and Tesla's work because of the fact that he was going to get the power meter off of your power. He would have given you cheap energy and cheap power and clean power. He did give you radio, he gave you fluorescent lights, he gave you the things that made motors and generators, and he gave you the electrical 20th century. He would have given you a lot more had we listened to Tesla and funded him. Tesla's advanced knowledge of the laws of electricity and magnetism, combined with his ability to put them into practice, gave him foresight into the next generation of electronics with regard to light and its structure. He was an ambitious man who was a great favorite in society where he would show a light bulb in his hand burning without any electrical connection. Tesla said, I could only achieve success in my life through self-discipline, and I applied it until my wish and my will became one. He was a magnificent genius, and had he been funded to continue his work, he would, the world would have been 100 years further in science than it is today. Here are some uh, 80 years later, so to speak, after the collapse of his magnifying transmitter. And here we are trying to rediscover what Nikola Tesla was doing right at the turn of the century. And so we're almost a century behind where we should be. That's the importance of Nikola Tesla. Progress is the process of moving forwards and not backwards. It is a combination of achievement and forward vision which serves its creator without fear of unforeseen consequences. There can be no progress if these rules are not observed. People always back something they call progress without giving it a proper definition. I think technical innovation is not progress by a long way. Technical innovation can only be progressive when it is combined with a step in the direction of humanity. And it's just that I miss. Nuclear power stations are not progress. Because of this monstrous gigantomania in the buildings and the walled up concrete areas and the risks, you are here playing with a fire that can't be put out. And the risks are extremely inhuman. And so these gigantic buildings are put up, and especially the military industrial building complexes, which in the end all lead to the scars of this pseudo-progress practically destroying the natural foundations of human life. And so that the whole of society becomes in effect a society of chaotic beings that will lead to global suicide. Real progress is being made in a laboratory in Canada. Here, the full significance of the physical laws of light and space have become clear to John Hutchison, and he is utilizing this knowledge to produce cause and effect experiments which lead to an understanding of the harmony of nature. Science, in harmony with the laws of nature for the good of mankind, will hold great values in many fields and would advance its course beyond our present comprehension. John Hutchison has been working in the areas of electromagnetic forces and the changes in the molecular structure of materials for many years. He has in this time achieved a breakthrough in anti-gravity knowledge, providing spectacular examples of heavy objects flying through the air without any visible signs of propulsion. He has also made amazing discoveries concerning the alteration of compositions of materials by subjecting them to a form of electromagnetic bombardment. We're looking at something which you know shouldn't be happening. The result of these experiments showed in graphic detail metal heating to a near liquid state without heat. Hard metals would turn into soft rubbery objects, proving that any substance could change its form if the science involved was understood. I immediately realized that this had tremendous significance. It has significance in space, 
look at military implications, and its understanding could possibly open up a whole new energy source. Hutchison is one of the growing number of scientists who realize that by applying physics to the natural laws of the universe, science will be taken into areas previously unrecognized. John Hutchison's achievement will give science a new momentum as it moves into the next century. The technology that we are aware of is quite staggering anyway. But then there is also the technology which um, the governments are uh, putting together, which we don't know about. And they've obviously got their own reasons for their secrets. But if we had any comprehension of how advanced this technology was, then I think people would then begin to realize that even our own people are far more advanced than they would believe. And once they can realize how wrong they were in this direction, then they can start to wonder, well, if we are as advanced as this and we'd no idea of this, is it not feasible that there is something out there which is more advanced than this? And perhaps all the technologies which are being put together at this moment in time are catching up on our alien friends, which I very, very much doubt. But I'm sure that is the reason this technology is being put together. You've got to realize that things are not always as they seem. And once we can get out of this thinking, out of this box we're in, that there is something more than what we are being taught, what we have learned, there are things outside the scope of this, um, then I think you'll begin to see the potential for people from out there visiting us. And uh, not just now, not newly visiting us, but I've been visiting us for hundreds of years. The truth about UFOs may be painful for us to face, and this might provide a continuing rationale for the government to maintain secrecy. But the truth will and must be known eventually. Continuing our denials and fears, in my opinion, are only adding to the problem. We are all in this together. In a time of opening relationships with the Soviet Union, we have the potential for radically demilitarizing our foreign policy, reallocating those resources toward preserving our planet and opening ourselves to the global village. Part of that new reality is embracing the unknown and the possibility that we have visitors beyond the Earth or beyond our dimensions of time and space. We must enter our new openness in peace and without recrimination. Our government of the people, by the people, and for the people needs to be involved in the process, not as a hostile, separate, secret unit. I therefore advocate an orderly, non-vindictive, congressional investigation of UFOs and a change in government policy on supporting research in these and other phenomena. The late philosopher Joseph Campbell once said that we are living in a time in which our ignorance and our complacency are coming to an end. It's time we let go of our fears and evolve to a higher awareness of ourselves and our place in the universe. Maybe the cover-up was in our best interest, maybe not. Maybe the government underestimated the intelligence of the American people and decided we just couldn't handle it. But let me tell you this, the truth is still the truth and nothing can change that. Not the military, not the government, and not me. Although mankind has been faced with many crises throughout history, he has always been able to overcome them. Today, the vast power and unlimited potential of man's mind is understood. In fact, he's created computers that can pick up and even reflect his own thoughts. Man is a complex whole, possessing the capability to make matter visibly change. With the power of his mind, he can tap the energy source of the cosmos to manifest all possible necessities of life for himself. Thoughts are energy, energy influences matter. The technology involved is one of peace as it eliminates war. And it's only a matter of time before everyone discovers this ability.
if we can create in the laboratory without any doubt a mind over matter interaction that's a few parts in 10,000, certainly all you have to do is extrapolate that a little bit to come up with a mind over matter mastery that could happen later in our own development and certainly what seems to be true in some of the UFO visitations. And of course also we have various case studies like Sai Baba being able to materialize and dematerialize things in his hand or various forms of levitation. These are all things that are very real. They're not, uh, you know, uh, drummed up by people. It's just that our ability to face that reality has been quite compromised. I should have known all along that the so-called new physics in a way actually makes all of this possible. That in a way we physicists have for kind of forgotten what we're, we're all about. Uh, Einstein one time said that the whole purpose of science is to awaken the cosmic spiritual feeling. And we scientists are among the last to embrace that. The cosmos is the energy and lifeblood of all things. Man is part of this energy and therefore holds the potential to achieve literally anything. Science is in the early stages of attuning to this enormous reservoir of knowledge where anything is possible. Our comprehension of such things is limited only by the painful realization of change. The idea of a living cosmos is such a new concept that we have not accorded it its rightful place. Contrary to the popular view, it can be shown and conclusively proved that that structure, that has an internal structure, of incredible order and beautiful order. It's filled with electromagnetic waves going in, in bi-directions. Pick a frequency, there's a wave going in one direction and a wave in the other direction. The wave that's going backwards is an anti-wave. It's a, it's a time-reversed wave. And the vacuum is structured. This potential, a vacuum is just potential is all it is. Uh, this potential is filled with the harmonic series of these waves. And so it structures spatially by bidirectional wave sets, and it structures vertically in terms of harmonics. Now, if you then invoke this structure, and you do that with a nonlinear material, and you put in one wave in the nonlinear material, that material will take from the vacuum that excess structure because it turns everything into a potential and it will put out multiple frequencies and harmonics. That's what nonlinear materials do. Interestingly enough, if you take time reversed waves and put in those harmonics, when they back up through, they will restore one wave. You can gather the energy and collect it and integrate it together and produce a single thing of much greater energy and lower frequency. And so what you have is the vacuum structures in frequency and spatially, and the connection of waves. And by the way, these waves do not have to move at the speed of light. They can have much greater velocity. Yes, um, our knowledge grows rapidly in almost every discipline. Conservative um, scientists in the past, or if you like, futurologists, um, have always been um, too cautious too conservative in their estimates. We know that um, there's a turnover every five years of doubling our knowledge, with the consequence that we have a completely different view in the world. Most people can't even keep up anymore with the advance uh, in science. Um, they have problems understanding modern computer science, cybernetics, um, biogenetic engineering, um, or nuclear physics. We talk today uh, about uh, great unified uh, models uh, of the natural forces. Um, the man on the street can't keep up, and um, he is only superficially informed about new aspects. We don't know what will happen in 20, 50, 100, or 1,000 years. Um, however, there's one thing we do know, that whatever happens in the future, science will have advanced far more than we can possibly think of today. And no imagination, no fantastic model that we may produce today will justifiably come close to the actual advance in 1,000 years. 
we really do have right now available to be born a completely new and drastically extended and drastically more capable physics which unfortunately unfortunately four nations of the world have weaponized but kept secret from their citizens and from the rest of the world and what i am saying is that it's high time that instead of just using this in secret to build more weapons to kill more people and hurt more people or control more people what we need to do is bring this out in the open and let's use it for the positive benefits to heal people to give them cheap energy and clean energy to clean up the biosphere to clean up our whole act uh, to be able to heal all these diseases and this kind of thing that's what i'm saying we've got to get on with the job Life on your Earth is dependent on new sciences and technology to achieve advancement. When your governments were first introduced to our advanced technology, their reactions were horrendous. Because the motive to gain power and control people was foremost in their mind, the technology was suppressed from the world. Technology should be made to work for the good of all, and placed in the hands of people of understanding who care and can control it towards a free world. I think the first point in overcoming any difficulty or any problem or any crisis is to have the faith that something better is possible without faith in without trust that it can work out better without the vision of something greater it, it won't happen so i think we have to have some kind of vision some kind of faith in traditional christian terms this is the idea of the kingdom of heaven and most visionary schemes in the west are under the influence of this judeo-christian model that at the end of history there'll be a new era a new dawn a new age the kingdom of heaven um, a utopia. Well, I mean, there are many different ways of formulating this. We have to think this. I think it's built into our whole civilization. It's very difficult for us not to think this. Or at least if we don't think it, we despair.
as our living planet drifted on the sea of eternity, soon after the dawning of the 20th century, the winds of change began to blow. Events were to take place which would change the course of mankind forever. The atomic age had arrived. As man detonated weapons of immense power, lights started to appear in the sky in a way that suggested that something was following the course of events. The shattering thought imposed itself that we were perhaps not the only inhabitants of the universe. Since the beginning of civilization, we had been watching the stars, never dreaming that they, in turn, might be watching us. History was about to change. Because these lights appeared suddenly in the sky over Washington on July 20th, 1952, moving from the White House to the Capitol, hundreds of people witnessed the extraordinary event and it left them stunned. The lights instantly jumped from one position to another. They were also observed by high military officials who knew what the lights were trying to say. The public had never seen anything like this, whereas the military had already a long history of involvement with these alien visitors, but had kept it from the public. An immediate emergency meeting was called to formulate a plan to divert public attention away from the occurrences. From that day on, it was decided to place the subject under the highest classification of security. Then came the first announcement to mislead the public made by Chief of Air Intelligence, Major General John Sanford. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. From that day on, the biggest secret of the century began. How did it all start? After the first atomic bomb was detonated, more tests were made of the effects on the environment and human subjects to gauge the degree of contamination unleashed. No knowledge of the devastating long-term effects existed at this time. Here in New Mexico, an army base close to a small town called Roswell became the focus of attention on July 2nd, 1947, when Bill Brazel, a farmer, found a crashed disc-shaped craft on his land. The military arrived on the scene and quickly isolated the spot when they found debris scattered over a wide area. They also found four dead humanoid alien bodies who had been ejected from the craft. Because of many recent UFO sightings by the military, they accepted the existence of visitors from outer space who obviously possessed a technology which was far beyond our understanding. Now for the first time, they had tangible evidence and were eager to learn its secrets. Roswell was the home of the 509th Bomber Wing, the sole American atomic bomber group. Major Jesse Marcel, an Army intelligence officer, was engaged on the recovery operation and asked Walter Hott, the Army Public Relations Officer, to prepare a story for the local newspaper. He told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone. When it was done, to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time, which is what I did. The story was published in the local paper. The news was also prepared to be aired by the local radio. Plan generated by these people from the military industrial complex after the Roswell crash was immediately put into place. All of the generals and admirals and advisors and scientists were contacted and ordered to proceed to a base in Colorado where they were driven, picked up, and driven to the crash site. Now all of these men are out have gone to the scene to see for themselves uh, what an alien vehicle looks like. And they were going to advise General Marshall directly, who was controlling everything from remote position, telephones, 
on how to proceed. And when an operation is that big, you can't cover everything up. We discovered that the owner of the property where the vehicle came down was uh, arrested in his house with his family, and they were kept in the house for four days, not allowed to go outside. All the roads in the area were blocked. All access was closed. People that lived close enough to look, know something about it were kept in their houses. Now, if it never happened, then this evidence wouldn't exist. But now we are finding solid evidence that something strange did happen, these events actually took place. Then we found people who observed the recovery of the craft from a distance that saw the, the, the task force moving across uh, off roads over country to uh, a secure military facility in Los Alamos. Uh, and, and with these leads, we were able to turn up other witnesses, all of whom had been sworn to secrecy by their superiors at the time they participated in these events. And only a few of them would talk to us, and only on condition that they not be identified because of their vulnerability. Uh, what happens in a case of violation of security oaths of this nature, they could lose all paid allowances, do whatever they come to, they could be imprisoned, and they could be fined a, a lot of things that none of them could stand. Through Secretary of State General Marshall, the security of the UFO situation was intensified. A closer relationship developed between the military and Majestic Twos Technologically Advanced Research Center in the United States. The wreckage of the Roswell crash was dismantled for analysis. The matter was considered of such importance that the orders came directly from President Truman. Under the cover of the CIA, Truman created a group called Majestic 12 for dealing with and covering up all information about UFOs. President Truman gave the task of handling UFOs only to the highest ranking generals. After the Roswell crash, a special group of scientists was formed and facilities built to be prepared to deal with any further UFO crashes which would occur. Wendell Stevens was a lieutenant colonel in technical intelligence in the U.S. Air Force and is now a UFO investigator. Now having a, a, an extraterrestrial vehicle, and some bodies in their hands didn't know when the next one would come down, where they came from, what they were going to do about it. There were a lot of unanswered questions. And the United States was in a turmoil at the time administratively because we were shifting from a war economy and the military industrial command structure to a civilian structure. Uh, so the military was still dominant and they wanted to keep control of this until they knew what was happening. So they created, remember, General Marshall was our Secretary of State at the time. He was a four-star, five-star general. Uh, these people selected certain representatives from the military industrial complex that they controlled, generals and admirals, and certain scientists that uh, worked with the military and worked with uh, industrial planning. These men were designated as a task force to take charge of any event that followed. And it, one did, almost a year later, on the 25th of March of 1978, next one came down in 1948. The next one did crash, and it came down under observation by radar so that we knew where it landed at the time that it struck the ground, and a helicopter was over it in less than an hour. It reported what it observed, and the video, but Judd Roberts, the radio station manager, was warned not to broadcast it. Sorry. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, you are, we, we understand that you have some information we want to assure you that if you release it on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy. And so we suggest that you not do it. He said, when I mean in jeopardy, like maybe three days. Preparations were made at Roswell Army Base for the transport of the wreckage. 
Robert Shirky witnessed the secret handling of the parts. They came in the front door, straight down the hallway, and right out onto the ramp to climb into the airplane. These were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed uh, flying saucer at that time, a UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. Very short, very quick. Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the ops office. And I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see too. <laughs> On instructions from the Pentagon, Thomas Jefferson DeBose and General Ramey created a cover story saying the crashed object was a weather balloon. We used that in order to uh, assuage the curiosity of the press. The wreckage was loaded back onto an aircraft and flown out under cover of great security and secrecy to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The pilot kept silent for several years, but informed his wife after the story appeared in a newspaper. I guess now that uh, they're putting in the paper, I can tell you about this. I wanted to tell you for years. He said, I want you to read this article because it's a true story. And I not only know that it's true, but I'm the pilot who flew the wreckage of the UFO to Dayton, Ohio. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was considered the 